We will now turn to the topic of energy levels and discuss the following points. Energy levels and energy subsystems, energy gaps and the population of energy levels. An atom or a molecule can adopt only certain energy values which are the eigenvalues of its Hamilton operator according to quantum mechanics. Therefore, the possible energy values, also called energy levels, are discrete and there are gaps between them. The state of lowest energy is named ground state. All other states have higher energy and are called excited states. Sometimes two states have the same energy, then they are called degenerate. This degeneracy can be lifted by a perturbation, for example by interaction with an external influence. An example are the energy levels of the nuclear and electronic spins. In the absence of an external magnetic field, they are degenerate, which means that the energy does not depend on the spin orientation. However, when an external magnetic field is applied, the degeneracy is lifted and the different spin orientations have different energies. One says that the magnetic field splits the spin energy levels. Another important concept is that of energy subsystems. Often one can consider a molecule as being composed of several subsystems, like the subsystems of the electronic orbitals, of the electronic spin, of the nuclear vibrations and of the nuclear spin. Often these subsystems are quite independent from each other. For example, one can consider the electron orbitals separately from the nuclear spin orientation. This is an approximation of the real case and assumes that it does not matter so much to the electrons what the nuclei do and vice versa. Or one can consider the nuclear spins without taking into account the nuclear vibrations and vice versa. Each of the subsystems contributes to the total energy and this equation lists the contributions to the total energy. We have the energy of the electrons in the orbitals, the energy due, due to the vibrations of the nuclei, the energy of molecular rotations, the energy due to the orientation of the spins of the electrons, the energy due to the orientation of the spins of the nuclei, and the energy due to the movement of the molecule in space. In the equation, the energy contributions are listed according to the separation between energy levels for the different subsystems. This means that there are large gaps between the electronic levels. The gaps are smaller between the vibrational levels and decrease for each of the following contributions. They are smallest for the translational levels, which can approximately be regarded as being continuous. This is our equation again, and I said already that the different contributions are listed according to the gaps between the energy levels. In spectroscopy, these gaps are important because they define the photon energy needed to induce a transition between the energy levels. If the photon energy matches the energy gap between the ground state and an excited state, then there may be a transition between these two states. To excite electronic transitions, we need photons with an energy that is relatively high. To excite nuclear vibrations, we need photons of lower energy because the gaps are smaller. And the photon energy required to induce transitions decreases as we go from subsystems on the left to subsystems on the right in this equation. It is much lower for inducing transitions between electron spin orientations than for inducing transitions between vibrational levels, for example. When we need photons of different energies to induce transitions in different energy subsystems, 
This implies that we need photons from different spectral regions in the spectrum. For example, for electronic transitions we need photons from the ultraviolet and visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. To induce vibrational transitions we need photons from the infrared spectral range. For electron spin orientation changes we need microwave photons and for transitions between different nuclear spin orientations we need photons from the radio frequency spectral range. All this means that if one wants to study a particular property of a biomolecule, one has to use the appropriate spectral range. In turn, the spectral range determines the technical implementation of the experiment, as different materials and different approaches are needed for different spectral ranges, for example to guide and detect radiation. We will now discuss an example where we consider the two subsystems of the electronic orbitals and the nuclear vibrations. We will encounter the energy levels of these subsystems in the next few lectures. The electronic energy is the sum of the energies of the electronic orbitals and the vibrational energy is the sum of the energies of all nuclear vibrations. The figure shows a simple representation of the energy levels of the electronic ground state and the first electronically excited state and of the vibrational levels in these states. The vertical axis is the total energy of the molecule. Shown are two electronic levels. These are the bold lines here and here and on top of those the vibrational levels here for the ground state and here for the excited state. The bold lines consider only the energy of the electrons, whereas the thin lines consider the total energy of electrons and nuclei together. The bold line on the bottom is drawn for the electronic ground state and the thin lines indicate a few of the vibrational levels which belong to the electronic ground state. This is the vibrational ground state, this is the first excited state, the second and the third, and so on. The thin lines are drawn with respect to the electronic energy level. In other words, the vibrational energy is added to the respective electronic energy. This is the total energy of the molecule in the vibrational ground state. This the energy when it is in the first excited state of the vibration. This the energy in the second vibrational state and so on. There are many more levels that I did not show in order to not to make the plot too confusing. The upper bowl line illustrates the energy level of the electrons in the first excited state and the vibrational levels belonging to the electronically excited state are depicted above. Now I have a question for you. What is the lowest total energy of the molecule? Is it this level or this level? Pause the video now until you have arrived at an answer. The right answer is it is this level. Because this level corresponds to the lowest energy of the nuclear vibrations and electrons together. The vibrations cannot have a lower energy than their ground state energy. The bold line does not correspond to the lowest total energy because it ignores the energy of the nuclei. The lowest thin line is higher than the bold line because the lowest energy of the nuclei is different from zero. In this illustration, the electronic ground state energy is shown separately from the ground state energy of electrons and nuclear vibrations together. However, in many illustrations, these are combined. This is shown, shown on this slide, where the bold line illustrates the energy of the electrons in the ground state plus the energy of the nuclear vibrations in their ground state. In other words, 
It illustrates the total energy of the molecule in the ground state. The upper bold line illustrates the energy in the electronically excited state and in the vibrational ground state of the electronically excited state. When one considers both the electronic states and the vibrational states together, one uses the technical term vibronic state. So the plot shown here shows the energy of the vibronic states. The difference between these two ways of illustrating energy levels is shown in this slide. On the left hand side we have the case where we consider the electronic and vibrational energy levels separately. The bold line illustrates the energy of the electronic ground state and ignores the energy of the nuclei. The lowest possible total energy is given by the energy of the electrons in their ground state plus the energy of the vibrations in their ground state. This energy corresponds to the lowest thin line. On the right hand side, the energy levels of vibronic states are plotted. Here the bold line corresponds to the lowest energy of electrons and nuclear vibrations together. Thus it illustrates the ground state energy of the molecule and its energy equals that of the lowest thin line on the left hand side. Now the question is, when you see such an illustration, how do you know whether the energy of the vibronic states is shown, as here on the right hand side, or whether the energy levels of electrons and vibrations are shown separately, as here on the left hand side? The answer to this question can be found by looking at the spacing between the bold line and the first vibrational level shown. On the left hand side, this spacing is much smaller than the spacing between the subsequent vibrational levels. Whereas here on the right hand side the spacing to the first vibrational level shown is the same as that to subsequent levels. When the first spacing is smaller than the other spacings then you know that the first thin line corresponds to the vibrational ground state because the energy of the vibrational ground state is just half of the energy difference to the next vibrational states. In contrast, when the spacing is the same as the other spacings, as on the right hand side, the energy of the vibronic states is shown. Then the bold line illustrates the lowest possible energy of the system. Now we ask the question, which of the many energy levels is occupied when we do our experiments? The relative occupancy of two states with an energy difference delta E between them is given by the Boltzmann distribution, which is shown here. The Boltzmann distribution gives us the occupancy of the upper energy level and upper relative to the occupancy of the lower energy level and lower. This ratio equals E to the negative difference in energy divided by Boltzmann's constant K times the temperature T. A special case of the Boltzmann distribution is that calculated for one mole of molecules. In this case the Boltzmann constant K has to be replaced by the gas constant R. Remember that RT equals 2.5 kilojoules per mole at room temperature. What does the Boltzmann distribution imply? The case for a large energy difference is shown here on the left hand side. Then most of the molecules are in the ground state and only a few or none in the excited state. The right hand side shows the case when the energy difference is small. Then the occupancy of the higher energy level is nearly as high as the occupancy of the lower energy level. An important question now is, 
What is a small energy difference and what is a large one? As you can see here from the argument of the exponential function, the energy difference delta E is compared to the thermal energy kT. So large and small refer to the energy difference compared to the thermal energy. So a large energy difference, as shown here, is large compared to the thermal energy, indicated here by this red bar. And a small energy difference, like this one, is small compared to the thermal energy. As mentioned above, the energy gaps between adjacent energy levels depend on the subsystem considered. For example, electronic spin states are very closely spaced. Nuclear spin states are even closer. This implies that their excited states are considerably populated at room temperature. For nuclear spin states, the populations of excited state and ground state are nearly equal with only one out of many thousand spins more in the ground state. In contrast, different electronic orbitals have quite large separations between their energy levels. As a consequence, only the ground state is populated at room temperature. Intermediate between these extremes are the energy gaps between nuclear vibrations. The gaps between energy levels of the rapidly oscillating vibrations are still larger than the thermal energy, meaning that most molecules are in the vibrational ground state. However, the gaps of slow vibrations are comparable to the thermal energy, meaning that a considerable number of molecules are in the vibrationally excited states. Summarizing this section, we have discussed a number of important concepts the concept of discrete energy levels, the concept of different contributions to the total energy, which gives rise to different energy subsystems. We have learned that these different energy subsystems have different energy gaps and therefore that we need photons with different energies to induce transitions in the different energy subsystems. This means that the spectral range that we use in our experiments is determined by the energy subsystem that we want to study. We also have discussed technical terms like ground state, vibronic state and degenerate states and we have discussed the Boltzmann distribution. Finally, I have a task for you, which is List the following properties according to the spacing of energy levels. And these properties are Electron spin orientation, ES Electronic state, E Nuclear spin orientation, NS And vibrational state, V So which of the following alternatives is correct? Is the spacing largest for the electronic states? followed by the states of electron spin orientation, followed by the vibrational states, followed by the states of nuclear spin orientation, meaning that the gaps between the nuclear spin orientation states is smallest and that between the electronic states is largest. Or is it one of these other alternatives? Pause the video now until you have come up with an answer. Ok, here comes the answer. The spacing of energy levels is largest for the el electronic states. It is smaller for the vibrational states, even smaller for the electronic spin states and smallest for the nuclear spin states.